Okay, I'll, be, I'll try to be real brief, as I, you know, again, very happy that Keanu has been willing to come and join us again uh, this evening. Uh, he's been here several times, and we try to get him as much as possible as part of our commitment to education. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm sorry, just took a couple of notes just to kind of uh, reaffirm um, some of what Keanu talked about. Um, <clears throat> there are many wise people that say a lot of wise things out there, and I'm one who always goes for those quotes. You know, uh, Stephen Biko, a great South African fighter against apartheid who lost his life as a young man fighting for the rights of uh, South Africans against the injust system. And a very important quote that's related very much to what Keanu has shared tonight. And then he says, the greatest weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. The greatest weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. So when you look at the situation in Hawaii, it's very clear to understand. You see, I mean, if you really understand that, issues like history, religious, of, of knowledge of self comes very much into play in regards to how we, we, we engage the future. That what binds our thinking, what binds our future, really is due to lack of understanding perhaps of who we are. And the lack of our understanding many times come from, what do you want to call it, miseducation, indoctrination, colonization, uh, and a list of words can go on and on. The system is one which, in 1897, what's so important about what happens in 1897? Second occupation. Second occupation. Okay. Even better than that. What's the most important historical event Especially for Kanaka. What happens in 1897? Anti annexation. Anti annexation, the Kuwait petitions. 39,000 were signed, signatures collected. In 1897, they knew this issue very, very well. They knew these questions of what was happening very, very well. And there's a fallacy that talks about, you know, Hawaiians, they kind of get along, unity. Blah, 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 blah. The fact is, in 1897, virtually every Hawaiian who could sign the name or fix the name to the petition, affixed the name. And this is in the most darkest hour of our history, in a sense, when they knew what was happening, what was occurring back in Washington, D.C. at this time, where the U.S. Senate was seeking to ratify the so-called Annexation Treaty, or Treaty of Annexation, Treaty of Session. And our kupuna gathered together, gathered the signatures, filed it as the voice of the people against annexation. And the truth is, because of that act of unity, the Treaty of Annexation Failed. So that's what Ken was talking about. So when people talk about the so-called treaty, you know, Hawaii was gotten by this treaty of annexation, the truth is there is no treaty of annexation, there is no treaty of session. It doesn't exist. They knew that in 1897. But what happened through these years and decades of miseducation? Our people began to, as the saying goes, the greatest weapon of the oppressor are the minds of the oppressed. But also, when you flip that over, so when you flip it around, the greatest weapon of the oppressed are the minds of the oppressed. So it's really our minds. And I think that's what's important about so when you When you start to see things in a, when you understand your history, and you understand what happened in 1897, when you look at the journey for our people today, it's not about us going to someplace new. 
we're not striving for some kind of recognition in a sense. The fact is, it's, you know, again, it's easy to go back where you were before, then go to some place. This is some place we traveled before. The unity that was possessed in 1897 was something that occurred in the time of Rakupuna, which means that there's no reason why it cannot occur again. But the key for it to happen to occur again, let's see, I'll say the point of it, the, re the way it's going to happen again is that our minds, we all got to be talking in the same understanding of history. You cannot have, for example, and this happened a few years back, I was at Yulani Palace when Senator Akaka was doing a speech there. And this was his words, and I was shocked that he said this. And he said, you know, in our history of said, in 1893, we were taken over, and sadly, our people scattered. That was his words. Our people scattered, and I was shocked. What happened to what happened in 1897? Our people didn't scatter. They organized. They put the nail down to the pepper forever as a means to show the will of the people. The will of the people. If there's any confusion on the will of our kupuna, the will of the kupuna is put to paper there. There's no confusion. There's no confusion. The unity of our people was displayed then. There's no confusion to that. So again, going to that same. Yeah? Our minds is the key. This understanding is the key. Understanding our history, to me, is the key to future. Yeah? To, to, to move forward in a very uh, educated way. As you know, as was kind of said earlier, you know, we have Makapo. How about you? Ha ha, hey, the hands just feel all around, guessing. No, we got to walk around with our eyes open. When we step, we firmly step, we know where we step in. And that's why, you know, as, as Kiano talked about that, Olero no yell. Yeah. Kawama mua, Kawama ope. Yeah, that's why we all know, yeah, Israel, Kamaka vivo ole. Yeah, the famous cover of his album. What is he doing? His back. He's showing his back. You might be wondering, why the heck is Israel turning around? See, now we say, this is part of this idea. He's telling us the message is face the future by looking at the past. Face the future by looking at the past. Then, the means of miseducation the appropriation of our minds will end. You see, to me, that's the most important aspect, that the key to our future development as people is based upon the necessity to educate ourselves about the past. Not so that we're stuck in the past, but so that we can step into the future. Um, <clears throat> And so we, we, we talk about, again, like, you know, with, with the words like C-Lands, when you hear people talk about annexation, which was mentioned the other night, in fact, some of you who were at the, the talk the other night, uh, one of the so-called esteemed the gentleman who was uh, supportive of the so-called Akaka Bill, you know, basically, I said, kind of resetting his issue, just kind of glanced over and said, well, you know, the annexation happened in 1898, and well, as if it was some kind of fact. When in truth, see, once you know, it's one of those once you know, once the light comes on, you cannot help to know. It's hard to put your head back in the, in the it's hard to, to uh, become blind again, in a sense. See, once you know, it's on forever. And once you share, once you teach, it's on forever. The light is on. And that's the power of the sharing, the wisdom, the education. And um, the last thing I just want to touch on, I heard someone talk about earlier a lot about the so-called transfer of citizenship. Now, if you look at the Organic Act of 1900, right, when the federal government was setting up, the U.S. federal government setting up the territory of Hawaii, and take a look there, I think it's Article 2, and it says something effect that those I would say again, uh, 
all citizens of the Republic of, the Republic of Hawaii are now citizens of the United States. Let me repeat that again. It says, all citizens of the Republic of Hawaii are now citizens of the United States. Those are the only words that address the people in regard to the citizenship of these islands. But you see, even when they try to lie, even in the lie has truth. Now let's ask the question, who were citizens of the Republic of Hawaii? Well, how many were there? Less than 4,000. Less than 4,000 were citizens of the Republic of Hawaii who swore allegiance to the Republic of Hawaii. That's it. How many people signed the petitions again? 39,000. 39, and yet, you still have people out there talking about this supposed democratic revolution that happened in Hawaii. <laughs> As if we cannot count for ourselves. <laughs> but let me repeat again. All those citizens of the Republic of Hawaii, it never ever addresses the Hawaiian subject, so-called citizens of the Hawaiian kingdom, it never addressed. All that's addressed, all that's incorporated by their own words are citizens of the Republic of Hawaii. So as you start to dig the point, when you start to people say, well, what's the evidence for it? The evidence speaks for itself. It's just a matter of reading through something. Even their own documents will reveal the truth. So you ask the question, well, if Hawaii was so-called taken, if the Hawaiian subject, subjects of the Hawaiian kingdom were, were all somehow transferred over to become United States citizens, where is the document or documents to prove that actually occurred? And the truth is what? There is nothing there. And as Keanu had mentioned many, many times, you know, we've been lied to and talked to as if we were adopted into this family. Yet when you find out that you were kidnapped, and then you find out all this time, no matter how much times they tell you you're adopted, you're still looking for those adoption papers. <laughs> and you ask me, where's the papers? No more. <laughs> no, 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 I, I get the papers somewhere in the back there. <laughs> and the truth is you realize that there is no adoption papers. But like any person, any human being, when you find out that you were kidnapped, think about it. How would you feel? What would you want to experience? I mean, your adopted family may have been good adopted. I mean, they might have the biggest house on the block, good swimming pool, <laughs> nice stuff refrigerator. You might have snacks every day after school. <laughs> but think about it. When you found out that you were kidnapped by the family, you know, in the end, it, it, you know, you still think about the family you were kidnapped from, no matter what. That even the promises of all the riches and things doesn't make the, the, the situation correct. If you say, well, you're lucky you were adopted by that family. Well, perhaps if I was adopted. <laughs> but to think that was, I was kidnapped by a wealthy family, it don't make the situation any better. And so that's why I say, if you approach that situation, if you understand and see yourself in that way, it's only natural that you want to learn more and know more about the family that you, which you were kidnapped from. So, and I'm going to pass it on because, uh, you know, I can keep on talking and ready to talk. I'll pass it on to the comments. Aloha kako. Aloha. kahu. Ohale kuli kukuhonua o iau. Um, I don't have the credentials like my brothers here have. I have a BVD. That, that I have. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I went to Hawula School. I don't know how I graduated, but I did from Tahoku. Uh, I managed to make my way here and realize that my, my place in this life, my calling and what have you. And I, li I like what uh, Keanu said. He, in order to know what you need to prescribe, you got to know what the... What broke? Our people is a spiritual people. So I want to shoot from that area, from the area of spirit. We know that if you get any kind of pilikia in our kino, in our body and stuff, we don't just go apply the, the la'au. There's some spiritual attachment that will bring that upon. 
So what I heard tonight is beautifully well put out as far as what would remedy and how to bring it, uh, fix the problem. But then we gotta go take them to another level now. And this is where my portion comes in. Uh, it, is that it, it comes onto a spiritual plane. Our Ali's knew that they needed to consult heaven. So they would go to the Kaulas. I mean, it's documented. You can look at the history of Kanalu, Bo'oku, Ohau, Elua. You can look throughout the written history and also the oral history. And you find that there are heavily influenced spiritual aspects to the matter. Case in point being Iyal Valley. There was also a prophecy that speaks of the breaching of Iyal Valley. And if should an enemy come inside, everything we hold dear as a people, this is my, I'm just quoting it. It's not exactly stated that way. Everything we hold dear as a people will dismantle itself. And it was Kamehameha himself who fulfilled that portion of prophecy. But even he consulted his kaula whether he would be successful in unifying all of the islands. And he was told, yeah, but first we'll build Pu'ukohola. And it was a threefold uh, prophecy that was spoken. The coming of the gospel and the missionaries and how they played out our government and literally turned our, you know, the authority over and brought us to where we're at right now is something that I believe heaven has well orchestrated, whether you want to believe that or not. And I speak as a kaula, I speak as one that knows how to tap into that realm because that is my, my place in the matter. Let me take you back just a little bit for a, a little back in, in time. I was taken into a vision and I was walking through this warehouse. And in this warehouse I saw blood splattered all over the wall. I saw bins set up and I saw body parts cut up placed in the bins. I had a contingency of people with me and I knew we were there to mourn dead. And when I got into that, that, that place I could hear Akua ask me the question, can the bones live? I said, I don't know. You know. He said, open your mouth, prophesy. I did. Don't know what I said in this vision, but what happened after I opened my mouth is the body part shot out of it, came to the floor, came together. And yet it was, never had life breath in it. Second question was asked, can the bones leave? I said, I don't know. I looked around as if I could see the winds, and the winds was divided and scattered, and heaven told me, open your mouth, prophesy, gather the winds. I did in the vision. Don't know what I said again. But after I spoke, I saw the winds come together as a funnel cloud that was twirling over this lifeless body, and when it emerged, that body stood up and it was an army. You can find this in the scripture as well uh, to verify that, but not because I would read that. If this is applicable to what I'm about to share concerning part of this remedy or the prescription to our nation to bring the life right back to our people. Reconciliation has been a very big thing. Throughout these islands, there have been churches coming up left and right. You name it, you got it, flying their flags over our flag, perpetuating the lie. I have been a thorn to the side of every person that supposedly stands for righteousness. I'm also a preacher of the gospel, so I know the biblical aspect and how there is one that sits above all nations. I don't care how strong the president is, what authority he holds, and whatever we think we hold. There is one that sits above all of these things, and this is where the council I'm, I'm sharing with you has uh, descended from. And because of the, the need to purify our altars and because the breach has happened, somehow, as the kahu, I have always inquired of heaven, why is it heaven never come to the rescue of uh, our, our people here? The altars of heaven, no need of an army to protect it. Something must have been breached on that level where our own was allowed to fulfill a prophecy and the altar was dismantled. Let me speak to those of you that are believers. When you look at the scripture, you will find out that when any, when any nation supposedly represents, becomes the mirror image of who the creator is on earth. If there is any kind of pilikia amongst within that circle that's supposed to be the mirror image, heaven has a way of bringing another nation upon it to dismantle it, to literally slick up, lick the nation until it comes down to the place where it realizes who's the authority, and then the restoration process takes place. What we're hearing tonight is all the restoration process. I have always looked back, as my brothers have been saying, you look back in order to see the future. That I have done. In regards to the vision, this is my place in the matter. Reconciliation has been that big word that has been flying all over the place. We have been accused because of our allies were masons and you know they, they, that's all part of the satanic stuff and whatnot, and that's why God would lead you guys nation and so on and so forth. And they would have prayer events throughout these islands. I literally went to DC three times in eight months to literally echo the voice of our queen, who stood in the place of a prophet when she went to DC. She literally said it's in our history. She says the time will come. You brought the gospel to us. But now the very one you introduced to us, I'm going to throw them right back to you. And this is, again, my words, but it's in the history books. She says, the judgments of Ahab and Jezebel will fall upon, perhaps not in your days, but in the days of your children. The evidence won't come one day. Everything will be placed before you. And I trust you, Christian America, will do the right thing. America has been also founded and based upon the, the principles of the scriptures. I have traveled through DC. I have saw all the, the, what it was literally made up. 
of and their ignorance concerning Hawaiian history and our own ignorance of our own history. You know, so the accountability, the, the, the judgments that the Queen brought upon America has to do with today. I can tell you this much, the prophets across America synchronizes their voice, they synchronize their voice, and the destruction of America is really at hand. I have probably been the only one that has come alongside and traversed the land with another card and saying, no, there is hope, there is a potential, if only America would make good. This prophecy does not have to be. But if, you know, my, my coming alongside has really been an adjutant to many people, and I, I have, without people having to say it, they wrote me off as far as uh, the words that I carry. There's many movements coming into our land with many prophetic words. One in particular came in and says, oh, the Lord told us the first shall be last, the last shall be first, because we were the last nation with the American, you know, on the, the star, the 50th star, and 50 in the prophetic sense, is a jubilee. In other words, if you owed something, that would totally be wiped out. And that's in the prophetic sense. And when we were given that word, I believe that with all my heart, in the sense that, their words was, whatever it is that the, the, the Lord is going to do within the island is going to be an example to the nations. I certainly believe that. But then when we gave you the mechanics of all of this heavy stuff that has gone down and how the church needs to stop talking about righteousness and put action to the words, and if we have not seen that yet, we still see the perpetuation of the fraud. So I always come and say, here's the biblical reconciliation. When you don't get wrong, you go one-on-one. -on -one. Our queen did that. Nothing happened. Biblical you go take partner. I think the Hubi Aloha Aina Kuwe petition of 39,000 signatures. What do you guys think? That qualifies for bring a partner and address the help? But still nothing has happened. Now we're on level three where we need to bring the matter, and this is my portion. I bring this and I push the issue with the believing body to stop only preaching but put the action. Because the nation is on the judge, your nation is on the judgment, and here's the reason why. It's not because of all of these other things, they're all part of the whirlwind of things. But this is the real reason why our queen, our nation, who once upon a time was Christianized, I know that's a bad word for many of you for obvious reasons, but the influence and the fulfillment of prophecy on that level brought things to the place where I believe Hawaii has been, is being used right now to literally bring the nations under judgment because this na the nations of the world will learn righteousness by the judgments of heaven. By me blabbing my mouth and being a thorn to everyone's side is really a grace card coming alongside and says, no, no, get option, get option. Will you pass me that book on that table, please? The, the, the one underneath. I have been amongst many movements in the islands that, are, that is of a prophetic nature. And um, I would literally go into the U.S. government to go pray with the pastors and literally hold their feet to the prophetic word that was given. And... Me and another brother would be the sore thumb, of course, in the midst, and people will always know, like, they get off. What do you call it? They evil every time we walk in a room because we always have something to say. <laughs> and it's not, and it's not something pre we're just holding the feet to the fire. That's right. When I was written off, after praying at the Aloha Stadium, and here's another incident that is very beautiful in, in nature because <laughs> there was a prayer assembly of churches gathered at the Aloha Stadium, the biggest stadium in Hawaii, right? Um... I wasn't supposed to be there except I was going to catch the flight go over to see where the church was regarding all the prophetic words that we, you know, the movement has heard regarding Hawaii. Uh, they had selected 12 people to pray. My couple was one of them that was going to be selected. He couldn't make them. was going to land Sunday. He get planning services. He knew I was coming in. So I told him, put my name in. I don't represent. <laughs> oh, by the way, what did they ask you to pray for? He says, government's oh, perfect. Yeah. So I show up at Aloha Stadium. First person to get up, has the whole stadium on their knees, repent to, to, to God for their pagan ways. I can say, me, I'm the only guy here in shots, you know, I don't even look like one pastor, I'm actually sitting on staring at everybody. <laughs> hundred guys at least, ministers on the field, and the stadium is packed with believers. Um, next person is the lieutenant governor, takes the stage. God has put us in position for such a time as this, brought our government to a crossroad, he never defined it. Next guy, Polynesian brother, gets up, has everybody dressed in white suits and military regalia. They lip sync to the song, We Need God in America, prophetically and symbolically sticks in American flags and stand them up. Then it's my turn. I chant my way up to the stage, take the mic, and I say to everybody, America is a blessed nation. The whole place. <laughs> I said, how many of you want to hear a word from God? <laughs> I hit the mic and I say, get your face off the ground. How dare you guys fly your flags over your churches, <laughs> preaching righteousness. <laughs> when you're all of this heaven in this land, and you talk in prophecy, it'll not happen until this issue is addressed. <laughs> Talked about the biblical reconciliation, of which I told you, you know, level one, two, three, Go one on one, take partner, and then bring the matter to the church. But how can uh, the church come into play when they're not even willing to walk the issue out? 
And that's, that's a key right there. And I told the people, I says, no, let me tell you something here. Our queen addressed Ahab and Jezebel. Here's the true story of Ahab and Jezebel. The leadership of Israel caused the nation of Israel to walk away from God and literally despise the holiness of a holy God and caused the people to walk away. So God created an elaborate plan how he was going to kill Ahab and Jezebel. He raised up a prophet and said, prophet, you go anoint uh, uh, Hezael, he will replace the Syrian king. You go anoint Jehu, he will replace the um, uh, king of Israel. And then you, Elijah, go anoint Elijah, he will be prophet in, you, in your state because you kind of get weak are, are, are removing you, replace you. Whoever has an L miss, Jehu with his sword will make sure they change over. And whoever he miss, I'm going to allow the prophet to complete the task. That was God's plan. Now here's Jehu coming to the tower of Jezebel. She's beautifying herself. And she's wanting to seduce the man of God who was on assignment to literally take her out. She had eunuchs on staff. He comes, Jehu looks at, Jezebel, uh, looks at the eunuchs and talks to them, not her. He says to you, eunuchs, and, and, and I said this to the state, and I says, and uh, the eunuchs are people that's on staff. They're in high seats of authority. They're on staff. They're, they're on the payroll. But now they're being required to throw their boss out of the window. There goes their income. But they knew that this matter was greater beyond their income. It had to do with the nation, and the head of the nation and the leadership was responsible for it. So they had to throw her out of the window. So I said to the people, I says, now let me talk to you, my fellow eunuchs. And according to Webster, you said that unit is someone who's in high seats of authority, but he castrated, unable to produce. And you can imagine the silence. You could hear literally a, a sin drop on the ground at that point, and, and nobody, mom was the word, mom's was the word. I only had to, but maybe a couple guys cheering for me on the, on the top of the ground. Go, 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 And the reality of the matter is that I was there to just pull the body into check. It has nothing to do with me promoting my title, promoting what I believe. I'm speaking as a mouthpiece of heaven. And by agitating and bringing things to that point, now everything is put into check. By me going to Washington, D.C., see, because when the churches literally wrote me off, they endorsed another prophet, the Hawaii State government did, by just sending out the email. This Jewish guy came out, and I said, I heard through the grapevine that this guy, he pro prophesied to the land, but, but the Lord don't speak to him until he touches the ground. So I took one stone from E.R. I was going to go to Honolulu and tell, man, prophet, touch the, touch the stone, prophesy to me. And I went to the HIC. This guy begins to speak, and here's the prophecy that he spoke, but he was very, walked very lightly on the issue of, of, of Hawaii. This is what he said. America, prepare yourself to receive the judgments of your God. I gave you the fatness of the land and put strength within you to overcome nations and kingdoms. But you now think that it was something that you have done within yourselves to have accomplished these things. Woe unto you and your mighty men of valor, for I, the Lord God, shall bring to naught your strength and ability to overcome. It is I, the Lord God, that does bring forth kings and nations. And it is I that tear them down. You have become an abomination to me. Your priests and your seers are as sleeping dogs that have refused to repent and seek me with a whole heart. They minister for their own gain. I, the Lord God, will bring them to naught and turn them over to believe a lie. I will cause the storms, earthquakes, and floods to become stronger and more frequent. I will send a sword through the land and will cause families to be at odds one to another, killing and being killed. Tumults will be throughout the land and your streets will run with blood, famine, and I will, send in, uh, I will send in the land, and you will watch as your children die from hunger. I tried over and over again to reason with you, O nation, but you would have them not. We will now see, as you have taught to have become your own God, if you can deliver these people in their time of trouble. I will laugh at you and call you a foolish nation. You have forsaken the living God, and I have now forsaken you. You will know in the end that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I was in the beginning, and so shall I be in the end. This was that prophet's word. I knew we was brothers already. Not because of the word he spoke, but I knew because of the judgments that is at hand. So going to D.C., because of the churches in Hawaii literally sending emails across, discrediting everything and the challenge that I put forth, I attended a pastoral breakfast, and here comes a, a national representative from the seat of D.C. that represents 12,000 pastors from 49, and if you like to believe the, uh, the lie, the 50th state. <laughs> And he invited pastors to come to D.C. for a pastoral briefing. Of course, I, had, I took the opportunity here on Maui to present the potential reason why, for their evaluation, why their nation is in such an array. That Hawaii has a very key part to play. I went to D.C. three times to, to pose that question. and to See, the judgments of heaven, the word of God always precedes the judgments. This is my place in the matter. And there is still hope, by the way. And the remedy that we're talking, this is just another level that, that is, I believe, is superior in the sense of spirituality as far as that is concerned. So, 
That's it. If you folks have any questions, now's the time to ask. I want to know if your cousin can help get this movie made. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you get the money, huh? <laughs> I haven't seen uh, Keanu in a long time. <laughs> it might be time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's... Got the connections. That's true, but I think, I think everything begins with individuals. When they see it is when they see it. It's like all of us. When you see it, you see it, you move, you move. You don't, you don't. Um, education and exposure is important. Yeah, that, and I keep harping on that. It's real. But what you do with it is, is up to you. The one thing I recommend to people, don't join anything. Just rejoin yourself. Connect yourself back to your past. Know who you are. I have a son that's um, in, uh, he's at the University of Utah. So he's taking a class up there. He's, he's, uh, he's a football player. So he's taking his class and uh, political science. So the teacher is teaching, no, I don't think it's political science. I think it's Pacific Island Studies. And the teacher's name is Anapesi Kaili. She, Kaili is our name. That was actually my papa's name before he took on side. I was out of respect for his adopted dad. Actually, she's Tongan. That's when Kaili is a Tongan name. I didn't know that. Yeah. But that was an introduction for my son to talk to her. And she started to share with the class that we're going to be covering Hawaii and the colonization of Hawaii and the effects on its people. You know my son. He, well, not you know my son, but my son raises his hand. Uh, excuse me. Six, five, 300 pounder, you know. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, we're not colonized, we're occupied. And she kind of looked at him with this look like, what do you mean? Well, she had required readings, you know, native books, I mean, native, from a native voice, no, native daughter? From a native daughter, yeah, Honani Trask. And he kept saying, no, 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 we're actually occupied, we're not colonized. And she was forced to answer questions that she couldn't answer before, because somebody was asking the right questions. That's all the way in Salt Lake City, Utah, yeah? So it's amazing how far this thing stretches. And uh, again, it's just knowing what's there and, but not, and I told him, I said, don't get an attitude. You still gotta get a good grade. <laughs> but just ask the right questions and qualify your statements with your footnotes and your citations and which is what the course is supposed to be. You know, so I think that's what we all have to do. We have to just begin to ask the right questions. And even if we don't know the, the answers, that doesn't mean you, don't, you can't ask the right question. Yeah. That's really all it is. So whether my cousin Keanu is going to do anything or not, hey, I hope so, but I'm not going to hold my breath. You know? But I'm going to do what I need to do, and I think other people need to do what they need to do. Yeah. I just love the multidimensional way that all of the pieces that you guys keep overlaying, it's like this flawless geometry is in place. It's, it's really remarkable. Thank you. I think you all pull ahead, that's the first thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 the pull ahead we're, we're, we're well trafficked. <laughs> yeah, a lot of traffic. I have a question here for all three of you guys. Um, you know, this pastor here at Kalaloui, he, you know, he's been As part of the, my eloquent speech at the Aloha Stadium, I did say to the crowd, I said, that to those of you who think, you know, who say, saying, gee, why you say beating us guys up over the head regarding this stuff? We know what's born there. I came purely from a uh, scriptural vantage point. I said, you know, Matthew chapter 23 says, Jesus said, it's not what you put on the altar that sanctifies the gift. It's the altar that you place your gift on that brings sanctification to that gift. I said, so to those of you that support your government, you financially hold them up, you know, you know and all that. Your job is to make sure that the, the, the laws and everything that it stands for is pono. Yeah. If you hold your peace, you're accountable not only to 
you are coming to that government to hold it in check, but the reality of the matter is that it's heaven the one that dismantles it and or sets it up. And if it's a bad representative, there's a higher thing that, that is at play here. And every single one person, no matter what, nobody's telling you to change from this government to that government. It's a matter of purifying the altars, mm -hmm. holding accountable. If you hold your peace, the judgments of heaven not only will fall upon that authority <coughs> there, but everyone that identifies with it. So the advice is hold accountable whatever seat of authority it is, especially in this issue concerning our nation. You know, America is purely under judgment, obviously. Our queen was the one that set it off. She's the one that prophesied that, took the hat and put on the prophet's hat and spoke that into existence for this hour. So I went there to just basically say, these be the days of your children. Awesome. I have a question. The pardon that the queen set up for all the people who broke the law, will it continue on till today, till everything's get back into order? Well, the, the question was, the people that the queen agreed to pardon, does it continue till today? Uh, no, they're all dead. <laughs> no, but if the, the, the treaties are being breaking anyway, with the military here, they know about it. Okay, that's a good point, because now we're getting into our implication with the law. See, we talked about their implication, yeah, as if that's something far out, away, historical. Okay, now it comes to us, and you remember when we started asking the right questions? Yeah. It gets you to ask more questions? Okay, people start talking about creating their own governments in Hawaii, whether a sovereignty group or other people knowing that the only government that can exist is under the executive agreement and then also the military government, then that's treason, if you really want to go there. Because that's exactly what the provisional government did. They got together and said they now call the provisional government. When you do those kind of things, it's treason. That's why the best thing that I say right now is just claim ignorance. I didn't know. You know, I say that, uh, you know, little joke. Hawaiians, uh, we tend to have big traps over here. You know where that's from, huh? Well, I don't know. <laughs> See, as long as we know, I never know. That's not treason. Yeah? You never know. I never know. You didn't know. Don't start going around making like you know. Because whatever you say can and will be used against you. Remember all of that that happened? So that's why when, when I was involved with this, especially at Perfect Title and, 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 and the case in The Hague and all these things, we have to make sure that we know exactly what we're doing so we don't pass right. that threshold right. of treason. Right. And I actually have to cover that in some of my articles because I knew that my actions... Whether I argue about it or not means nothing, but it could incriminate me. You know, so the first thing that I will suggest is don't worry about trying to create one government. The only government supposed to be here is the, is the Hawaiian Kingdom government that was agreed upon in the executive agreement. That we cannot touch. But what, play, what precedes that government because of occupation is a military government. That's just the law of occupation. That's out of our hands. But how do we hold the, the occupier the military government accountable. You just don't hand them the key, say, okay, now you're driving up because you're supposed to. No way. That's why when I'm, up at U, when I'm up at UH and I'm teaching this stuff in classes, I'm getting re people ready to hold people accountable. Like Kau said here, hold people accountable. That also includes each other. Yeah, because you're in Hawaiian and you said it, okay, he said it, you're in Hawaiian. No, no, if you said it, it's wrong, I will hold you accountable. Now, I may hold you accountable not in front of everybody to embarrass you, but I'll probably wait till you move on a side and say, brother, you know what? That, that, that's not the right thing. You know, learn that in the army. Don't embarrass somebody in front of everybody. You only antagonize the problem. <laughs> Pull them on the side and counsel them. Put them on the record. That's really all this is. So as we are beginning to address our own ignorance, we have to assume other people are ignorant too. And I cannot treat somebody any different than how I used to be ignorant. Because you know what? I didn't know this about 15 years ago. I have to assume other people were just like me 15 years ago when I talked. So if you notice what I'm speaking, the manner, I'm, the way I'm speaking is, I'm thinking, how would I like to be hearing this information? And make sure that I don't burn bridges before I cross them. Yeah, so in that, I believe that aloha is so important because aloha is something now we have to walk. And aloha, is a lot of humility. 
A lot of times I would see Uncle them going off on something. I just got to go, But, you know, it's, not, it's all good. Because, you know what, even if Uncle believes it, it never changed nothing. Executive agreement still exists. We occupied, da, da, da. The question is, how come Uncle doesn't know that? How come he, why, why doesn't Uncle know that? So now I got to figure out a way how to get Uncle to see it. And a lot of times, in order to get Uncle to see it, you got to get Uncle to know that, well, he always saw it. You know, like I tell my wife, I'm never wrong. I'm just temporarily off track. <laughs> so I believe all of us are just temporarily off track. We need to help each other get back on track. It's called Ho'oponopono. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, okay, first of all, the world court can only hear cases regarding sovereign states. They don't take any cases where you're not a sovereign state because it's a matter of international law. Yeah? In this case, the case was about the law of occupation. Now let me back up before that case, before that case took place and talk about what led up to that case. Okay. Now, imagine 15 years ago, I'm, I've come to the realization of this information. And you know what naturally happens is, now what? What do you do next? And then what we needed to do was to, to make sure that we can do title searches to qualify and prove that Hawaii is still a sovereign country. Okay. Now, to do that, we decided to follow Hawaiian kingdom law. Is that a question? or? You know I mean? What's the tipping point then? Is it going to be United Nations resolution or federal resolution? That's what I'm going to, I'm going to get there. I just never let you hold your hand up the whole time while I was like talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to get to that point, <laughs> guaranteed. <laughs> okay, so what we needed to do was to set up a company on the Hawaiian Kingdom law. And we're going to test it because, you know, the government is not here to accept our articles of partnership, articles of um, Articles of co-partnership. It's, it's a statute on the Hawaiian law. Okay, so we're going to play it. It's like we're pushing the envelope. So we're going to, and the way you do it, you got to file it in the Bureau of Conveyance. I'm not going to bore you with it, but there's a process to do it in an agency that still exists today. And we're going to test it. So we got it filed. Once we get them on the Hawaiian Kingdom law, then the question is, well, okay, well, who's going to hold the company accountable to Hawaiian Kingdom law if the military government is not here? But we can't, create a mil we can't create our own government, otherwise we're going to be committing high treason. You see, we're kind of thinking about this situation like, ooh, you guys remember the movie, the, the, the show MacGyver? Okay, we was becoming MacGyver. Okay, we're looking at how we're going to do something with this to get across the ocean. You got to get very creative. So one thing that we knew we had to do was to create a temporary governing body to represent the country called the Hawaiian Kingdom and be its mouthpiece, but not to be its government. How you do that is called acting. See, now I become my, like my cousin Keanu Reeves, I become an actor. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do something that we did in the military all the time. When a private, well, okay, let's say a lieutenant gets killed in battle exercise, the president, uh, the, the, the lieutenant gets killed, everyone in that chain of command from the lieutenant to the sergeant to the corporal down to the private, that's the chain of command. Everybody's taken out from the lieutenant all the way down to the private. Did you know that it is the duty of that private to assume the chain of command? Really? He now becomes an acting lieutenant. He is not a real lieutenant, he's an acting lieutenant by necessity. But at that level of being a lieutenant, he carries vicarious liability as if he was the lieutenant and every decision he makes is gonna get nailed. That's why in the army or the military, nobody wants to take the chain of command. So when nobody wants to take it, everybody says, when was your date of enlistment? The most senior guy, take it. So he's got to play that. So what we did, and then when the properly commissioned officer comes, he gets relief, he goes back down being a private. That, that's, that's the way the system works. Otherwise, if you're in war or in battle, all you got to do is take out the lieutenants, the game over. You're always supposed to assume the chain of command. That's to maintain the military or the structure. So what we did was we established what is called an acting government. 
an acting government on the Hawaiian Kingdom law through what is called the Council of Regency, Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution. Regency is a term defined as serving in the absence of a monarch. You can't claim to be a monarch. Monarchs got to be elected by the legislature, like Kalako and Lunalilo. You know, there's a process there. So you can't claim it. So we, we assumed it, acting, knowing full well we just committed high treason. Knowing full well we just committed high treason. The only thing we got is the excuse of necessity. And we had to make sure we document it. Now, under the law, there actually is court cases dealing with the limitation of necessity, which means if you assume in an acting position of government and you start to pass laws, that's treason. You're only supposed to hold down the fort. If you go ahead and start reinforcing your position, that's treason. You're only supposed to beat it holding down the fort. So we just have to be the mouthpiece. So all we do is just talk like a paper tiger. So we're going around giving presentations. Now this guy from the big island named Lance Larson, because I'm getting to the court case, I'm giving classes, presentations saying laws of occupation, administration of Hawaiian law, everybody got to follow Hawaiian law. That's what perfect title was doing, following Hawaiian law. But everybody else is not following Hawaiian law, but you got to follow Hawaiian law. This guy goes ahead and says, you know what, I will follow Hawaiian law. So he looked in the law book, he didn't see any law in the civil code that says he needs a driver's license because they didn't have automobiles in 1893. <laughs> I'm serious, that's really, that was his conclusion. So he took his license plates off, took off his safety stick, a registration, jumped in his truck, and in the back of his truck, he put this big placard, section six of the Hawaiian Civil Code. Big, bold, and in English, it says, the laws are obligatory upon all persons, whether subjects of this kingdom or citizens or subjects of any foreign state while within the limits of this kingdom. And brother goes around Hilo, driving around to get a ticket. <laughs> and a ticket, and a ticket. He got a lot of tickets. What he wanted to do was to go into the court and tell the judge, show me Hawaii is a part of the United States, so I need to follow U.S. law. If not, I got to follow Hawaiian law or I'm committing treason. How's that? Wow. Two judges recuse themselves. The last judge is Sanja Shudi in Keao District Court. And then Lance Larson has an attorney with him, a real attorney. Now one guy read one book, think the attorney said he like re represent him. <laughs> this attorney named Ninia Parks. And I get called in as an expert witness. And I get qualified as an expert witness on the stand. So I explain everything. Just like what we're doing here is this information. So the judge basically went back into our office. They didn't know what to do. Stayed there for like two hours. <laughs> she finally came out and she says, I'm going to rule, in, fa rule like in favor of the state. Mr. Larson you are fined $700, $900. Do you, plan, do you plan to pay that? And Lance Larson said through his attorney, I can't pay that because if I, if I pay that, I'm committing treason. You didn't answer the question. Where did Hawaii become a part of the United States? Because then when you show me that Hawaii became a part of the United States legally, I follow US law called my driver's license. And she said, that's what I thought you say. And she locked him up, ordered his arrest, locked him up for 30 days, seven days solitary confinement. Oh yeah, that's, see, that's what happens when you ask the right questions. So what happens then is Lance Larson's attorney files a case in the federal court against the acting government and the United States of America and the United Nations and is asking the court to protect her client until this issue is resolved because her client has rights under the law. So then she finds out that the U.S. attorney's office was going to move to dismiss the case this was in Judge Samuel King's uh, chambers. Move the case, uh, remove the case, dismiss it. Before they did that, she came to us and she started to talking. And she started talking and she says, you're still accountable because what she did was she was holding the acting government accountable for the protection of her client. She says, you don't want to assume the position, vicarious liability, right? You don't want supposed to be responsible for protecting my client. You the one I'm going to sue. And we said, we're responsible, but we're not liable. The United States military, they're the ones supposed to establish a military government. We're just a mouthpiece. So we said, you know what? We can, take this out of, we can take this out of the federal court. Go ahead and dismiss the U.S. so they can't come in. And then we're going to negotiate a settlement with you on arbitration. We're going to make a stipulation of agreement that both parties are going to go to arbitration at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague on whether or not your client has redress against the acting government for not protecting him. 
That way we go to the right court. So she dismissed the U.S. We entered into an agreement with her. It leapfrogged from the federal court in Honolulu to the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague. And when the court up there received the, this arbitration agreement from the federal court, they're like, it was almost like, well, it was, but it was like, this came from the U.S. federal court to arbitrate this issue regarding the occupation. <laughs> you know, like, wait a minute, I thought it was the 50th state, you know, those guys up there in The Hague. They could not find anything that would disqualify or show that Hawaii was not a sovereign state because the evidence was always a sovereign state. There's no evidence that that sovereignty was extinguished. The court had to accept the, the arbitration. The only thing they found on the record are United States laws passed by the U.S. Congress claiming to be in Hawaii when in fact they're limited to U.S. territory, which they understand. So here we go. We're getting ready to go to the case. And at the same time, my trial is going on on attempted theft of land. <laughs> So it's like I'm juggling so many different things. Now, when, the, when, when initial papers were sent up to the court, I called them, and this was in, was before May of 2000. I called the court in The Hague about a particular topic because I was the lead agent. We had two attorneys and two uh, uh, historians with us on our legal team. So I called them and I said, on a procedural question, and then they said, Mr. Sai, can you hold on? The Secretary General wants to speak to you. The Secretary General of the court, who's a Dutch national. The Hague Convention of 1899 is what established the Permanent Court of Arbitration, and the Dutch run it. So he, he comes on, his name is Secretary General Van Den Hout, and he says, Mr. Sai, um, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, because they're walking on pins and needles, you know, Hawaii is an occupied state, this is the world court, they're like, oh my God. So they want to make like they're pushing it. So he says, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, he suggested that I travel to Washington, D.C. with the attorney for Lance Larson, go to Washington, and meet with the U.S. State Department and give them a formal invitation to join in the arbitration. Basically, what he's saying is, you need to call the bluff. Because if you can invite them to enter the arbitration, they have an opportunity to prove that Hawaii is the 50th state, thereby killing this whole thing. That's how you maintain the integrity of the case. And I thought, perfect. That is good. See, you know what it's like? We've been playing cards all these years. First game is Old Maid, then the game change. Then uh, Go Fish, game change. Then now 52 pickup. And then all of a sudden we found out we're playing Texas Hold'em. And there's a big pot right in the middle. Now we know how to play the game, now we call it a bluff. So I went up to Washington, met with uh, John Crook from the U.S. State Department. At first, he thought I was a native Hawaiian fighting over land. I said, well, I'm a native Hawaiian, but I also got English, Chinese, and, I, and everything else in me. But I'm a Hawaiian subject. And I mean, maybe land, yeah, the entire country of Hawaii. <laughs> but I wasn't being sarcastic with him. As we started to talk, I said that I'm here under the, uh, by recommendation of the Secretary General, the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He knew who that was. That's when he started to watch his P's and Q's because he knew that our discussion was going to be reduced to writing. I'm going to file it with the court that they've been given notice to join in the arbitration. After that, I, we, I finished our meeting. I put everything in writing, put it on record in the registry of the case. And two weeks later, the American Embassy in the Netherlands notified the court they have no intention of stopping this case because they have nothing to show. There is no sovereignty of the United States in Hawaii. All you got is American law, which is the evidence of violating Hawaii sovereignty. You don't come out and use that in a world court. That's calling the bluff. But they said they have no intent of joining the case, but the request from the parties involved, us and Lance Larson's attorney, if they could have access to all written pleadings and transcripts of the hearing. Absolutely. Go, everybody, open up the windows. Everybody got to look at this. And it was from that point on, that the arbitration tribunal, the, the arbitrator started to step in and, the first, and then the hearing was set for December. December 7th, 8th and 11th at The Hague, oral hearings. And what the court needed to know, asked, the question was asked was whether or not Lance Larson can proceed to sue the acting government for not protecting him without the United States involved. 
Now, the reason why the United States was needed in this case, in international proceedings, it's called the indispensable third party rule. Because it was Lance Lar because it was the United States that arrested Lance Larson, not us. He was saying we were responsible yeah, and liable. We're saying, no, we're responsible by vicarious liability, but we're not liable because of occupation. So Lance Larson basically needed the United States involved in the case to maintain his suit against us. We're the defendants. So the hearing was set. We laid it out. And you know what? We're the defendants now. We're not supposed to be helping the plaintiff sue us. <laughs> I'm serious. That, you're not supposed to do that. But we said, we're going to do that. We're going to use the platform. So we started to use the platform to present Hawaii's independence and why Lance Larson can sue us. Because Hawaii's occupied. And this, but explain where the liability is. Yeah? Not that he can sue us, but we're going to explain why the U.S. should be involved. It, 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 it's like a game of chess. So basically what happened there was, um, again, we went to the Brussels, Belgium, met with the Rwandan ambassador. When we, when, we, when we got home, arbitration award came out in February. The hearings was in December. Arbitration award came out, and a friend of ours had a friend in the, in the registry, in the permanent court of arbitration. He called them. They love Hawaiians up there. I swear, they love Hawaiians. They, we was playing Hawaiian music, not in the court, but, you know, they had, like, cocktails and everything. But my friend forged the relationship with this Wahine. So she calls him. She tells him that the arbitrators gave you what you folks wanted. I'm like, really? Sure enough, they did. If you watch the hearings, the last day of hearings, we knew that Lance Larson needed the United States involved in order to sue us. So he could not get over that threshold. So what I did was I shifted and I said to the arbitrators, what we need from you is, is something qualified the status of Hawaii before it was occupied. We need you to verify Hawaii as a sovereign state, not implied because we're at the court. We need it explicit. And they gave it to us. And that's what I read off to you in paragraph 7.4, that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom existed as an independent state. Now that status is there where Matthew Craven can say, has the United States taken that sovereignty? Because now you're starting from a known point. So from, from that arbitration is what I was able to then go to the UN Security Council in July of 2001 and file a complaint with the UN Security Council against the United States. Because what we wanted to do was in this case, going to the idea of the UN, we don't go to a court to address this issue because the agreement with the Queen was really a matter of non-compliance. What that is, is you go for enforcement. You don't have a dispute. There's no dispute regarding the overthrow. It's done. All you got to do is carry out the agreement. The Security Council of the United Nations is the enforcement arm of the United Nations. So what I needed to do was to first of all see if we could get into the UN Security Council. There's a provision in the UN Charter that says non-member states, okay, sovereign states, non-member states can file a complaint with the UN Security Council. Hawaii is a non-member state because the UN was created in 1945. So I'm going to see if we can get in. So I went to New York City, July 5th, called up, called up um, the president of the Security Council. There's 15 members of the Security Council. And by the way, this is all in my law journal article and my dissertation. So I'm, it's there when you can, you can actually read it. So I'm just kind of paraphrasing. Isn't it amazing? It's like, you think I'm making this stuff up, yeah? <laughs> It's like a big storytelling. Geometry. But when I, what we wanted to do was, can we file a complaint with the UN Security Council? Because this is so huge, we wanted to wait for somebody as the president of the Security Council, because there's 15 members, 15 countries that rotate every month to the presidency. We want to make sure that the one that is the president cannot accept our complaint, because that would open up Pandora's box for themselves, meaning they have to accept it on the substance of it, not on the political correctness or incorrectness of the complaint. Because we're saying Hawaii is an occupied state by the United States. So we wait, and this was deliberate. Here's my background from the military comes in. It's all strategy and tactics. I want to wait for the biggest guy there to say no to us, but then he cannot say no because he cannot deny it. Remember, this is Nesty. I'm not saying agree with me. Say, can you deny it? Okay, I should be able to fight it then. I waited for China the Republic of China to step into the presidency in July of 2001. Because China cannot accept this complaint on the face of it if Hawaii is so-called the 50th state. 
because China was having problems with Taiwan with the United States. So if China accepts the complaint, thinking this is the 50th state, that's a green light for the United States to keep messing with Taiwan and urge them to declare their independence. Perfect. That's the guy we want. So, President, uh, so the Security Council, I call him up. This is, now it gets kind of hilarious. I call him up in New York. I say, hi, my name is uh, David Tsai. I kind of say Keanu. I say, my name is David Tsai. I'm the uh, agent for the acting government. I'm here to file a complaint against the United States according to article blah, blah, blah of the UN Charter. Huh? Can I speak to your Security Council advisor? Okay, hooks, up, hooks me up to Miss Wu. She jumps on. Perfect ac American accent, but she's Chinese. Probably trained and educated in the United States. She comes on. She goes, um, hi, may I help you? I said, yeah, okay, one more time. Hi, my name is David Tsai. I'm the lead agent for the acting government. I'm here to file a complaint, blah, 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 blah. She goes, uh, you know, you're in the wrong place. You're supposed to be in the Committee of 24 on decolonization in the General Assembly. See, they do with Native people trying to fight for decolonization, meaning they're not sovereign states yet. I go, no, no, excuse me. We are a sovereign state. We're occupied. Excuse me? Yeah, we're occupied. So I gave her the history of Hawaii. <laughs> just walked her through. And then I said, and an arbitration case just took place. And that piqued her attention, the fact that the case took place in The Hague. And then when I started mentioning the arbitrators, as soon as I mentioned all of them, she went, oh, I understand what you're doing. This is how you file the complaint. So she had me go to the security council, the bottom lobby, a courier came down, logged it all in, signed it, there you go. Now the only thing that we did in that complaint was not to initiate anything, was just to see if I could get in the door. So the thing said, the complaint said, we just request recommendations. What should we do? Knowing you're not going to answer. I just wanted to see if I could get in. Sure enough, I got in. That's in. Locked in. There was a Swiss law firm. A guy wrote a law journal article for the Chinese Journal of International Law in China, Patrick Dunbury. That's the guy I was meeting when I was in Switzerland. Remember when I called Craig, uh, Crawford from Geneva? He went and actually checked the complaint in the Security Council and said, damn, it got filed. You know, not like the circle file, you know, file 13, yeah, yeah, whatever. It was in. But, he, but he, what he wrote in his article for the Chinese Journal of International Law, about the arbitration case and the complaint was, it's still there and nobody's touching it. What's supposed to happen is the US is supposed to expunge it. Because when you challenge sovereignty, you gotta take it out. And he showed the examples of precedent cases where countries took complaints out. It's called estoppel. The U.S. cannot touch it because of estoppel and executive agreement. They touch it, it's, it's incriminating. So it's staying there. Now, you know that pre, uh, James Crawford, the president of the tribunal? He was also a member of the International Law Commission. His duty was to finish off Articles of State Responsibility, these are, these are issues regarding enforcement of international law. His job was to finish it and get it approved by the UN. He got it approved September of 2001 on exactly what the Security Council is supposed to be doing regarding enforcement. Our complaint did not cite anything from the Articles of State Responsibility because it wasn't approved yet. That was July of 2001. This is July, August, September. Two months later, he puts it in, it's filed. What we are doing, and what I cited in my dissertation and my law journal article, we are now preparing to amend the complaint to activate articles of state responsibility because it's already in there. That's really where this is going to the next level. As well as other issues here in the courts of Hawaii, it's getting everybody ready for this mass transition. Because I'm not telling you I think it's gonna happen. It's going to happen. Let me give you an example of why it can happen just like that. You know what I feel like? It's, yeah, it's going to happen. But it has to see. But you, you know what's interesting? It's like, you know when they say, if you, don't know, if you don't know how to fight is when you always fight. But when you know how to fight, you don't get into fight so many times. Because you know how. That's what they say about martial arts too. Huh? Yeah. You know what? I, never, I learned how to fight in this way. It doesn't mean I got to go fight. What I got to do is figure out a way to get this out. Now, What's very interesting about this is that this complaint can be activated at any time. And I'll give you an example of how things can happen without anybody even knowing it. Remember that Rwandan ambassador? 
Remember when he said that Rwanda is prepared to submit to the United Nations General Assembly the prolonged occupation of Hawaii and begin the domino effect because international law clearly says what you got to do next. That could happen like that and none of you would have known about it. That is the same thing that can happen here. I feel like I have the capacity of being a weatherman that I can turn on the hurricane. Really, you can. That's what, that's what they say. You can turn it on. The fact that I didn't, we didn't turn it on yet is because we're not ready yet. We're not ready. That's why I needed to get the PhD. That's why I got to keep exposing. But this is not depending upon everybody's exposure. This is just depending on the right time and sequence and when the opportunity arises. You know when you say you're going surfing? Don't try, don't try to catch waves. There's no more waves. But wait when the waves come. When the waves come, ride them. Right now, I can see the, 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 the rows are coming in. The sets are coming in. And we're getting ready to surf. The best thing that we need to do here is to understand that there is a way to fix this problem. Because what I'm sharing with you is what the legal and political issues are. There is also some very, very important issues. Like Kahu said, there's spiritual, there's cultural, there's behavioral, there's psychological. Hey, all these things come into play. If you've been led to believe something that's not true, you're not going to take it well. Well, the law is not going to fix that. Maybe my friend coming out upon a crab who's a psychology might have to go visit him a few times. <laughs> you know, and that's where education comes in, but we got to start talking. A lot of times, you got to talk when you don't understand. Don't hold it in. So a lot of times when our family members go to Iraq, like I have nephews that went, they came back from the guard, they was in war. One thing you don't want them to do is to shut up, talk, get it out. Don't hold it in. It's going to blow up. Yeah? That's what we got to do. We got to start talking. We got to have malama. We got to have aloha. We got to take care. That is beyond the law. And that's where timing is, is important. Yeah? So, so to explain that in a roundabout way, it can be fixed. The case in The Hague was very important because it hooked us up with people in the international community. And by the way, when the Security Council is going to be sought to amend, when we're going to amend that complaint, precedent shows that the Security Council will seek advisory and advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. That's the normal route that takes place when there's a legal issue before enforcement. And they give you an advice. advice. What's pretty interesting is one of the arbitrators in this case called the Larson case, Professor Christopher Greenwood, is now a judge on the International Court of Justice since this past February. That's pretty heavy. Talking about the stars lining up, like, whoa. <laughs> but I'm not predicting, I'm not saying he's gonna do whatever, I'm just saying there's somebody on that court that knows exactly what this case is about. Mm -hmm. And there was the president of the International Court of Justice that was in Hawaii. I actually heard him talk. President Owada, Japanese citizen, President of the International Court of Justice. He gave his talk to the Rotary Club at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the Monarch Room. I was invited to sit there and listen. That brother laid it out. It was almost, I swear, if you listen to him talk, it says it's everything I just said regarding international law. Because that's how they think. So I had the opportunity to introduce myself and share with him that our case was in The Hague also, and that one of his judges with him was the arbitrator. And I gave him a DVD of the Larson case so that he's also apprised that this has already hit that level. It's just a matter of time before it hits it again. So there's so many things going on that, that, are, that, that people may not know. But it all begins here with knowledge of what you know. And I hope that I've helped you or instilled in you burning questions to get more answers. Because that's good. And just keep asking, keep talking, keep sharing. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add to what Keanu shared and his thought that, you know, you know, for me, you know, as a, I mean, we, I mean, I mean, about 20 years, I think we know each other. Oh, yeah, a long time. It's kind of funny. The university actually used to pay us to go out and talk to our young people in the schools. You know? No, and we both had hair back then. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, for me, just you know, just want to share. For me, you know, I think it's an important piece to always remember. Always remember, you know, the part of this journey is not just about the restoration, reinstatement, re-recognition of our citizenship, our nationality. 
See, part of it also, for me, has always been to realize it's also that sense of self that has to be reawakened. You know, I always use a good example. I say, you know, it's not only about carrying that passport. Because we've been under the miseducation and under the control and indoctrination for far too long that we've picked up a lot of these habits and ways of thinking which have been uh, very destructive to ourselves and also the place we live. So part of this journey is to become, not, uh, you know, become uh, an independent nation again as much for me is to become independent yes. as people. Yeah, it's a spiritual journey. The consciousness of the people is part of that journey also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's part of that journey. So it's not just a political, but it's also understanding who we are socially, culturally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, just that consciousness, I was into this, you know, one of the things I learned, one of the best lessons I learned, I remember, I mean, a while back, and he told me once, you know, Kalikwa, wherever you walk upon this land, you know, you literally walk upon the EV of your ancestors. But to understand that and to think that and to react in that way, you see what I'm trying to say, you, you walk differently upon the land. You see yourself and the land in a different manner. You see yourself and humanity in a very different manner. Because we don't want to reduplicate those tendencies that have been put on us to become oppressors ourselves right. in the world. So part of this journey is to understand that healing is not only about, like, like I said, you know, getting this card that we can carry that says, you know, we are Hawaii national. But part of that healing and this journey is also uh, reinstating, re-recognizing our sense of humanity with each other and upon this land. And so, you know, with that, I just like to mahalo, and again, I, I behalf myself, and I really mahalo Keanu for coming and sharing. And, you know, I've seen this many times, you know, he's the greatest historian of, of my generation. You know, he's really helped to open the doors and, and, and um, understanding and to see firsthand. And I encourage all of you, check out his website. You know, one of the greatest things that Keanu has always done is Everything is shared, as you can see, never ready to share. You can read everything out there. You know, go check it out, like he said. You know, and I always tell my students, never believe anything I say. You should go find out for yourself. And, 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 and wonderfully, you know, Keanu allows this to occur. You can go. In fact, your complaint, I remember. I don't know what, the big one. If you want to get a good history of the Hawaiian Kingdom era, besides his dissertation, <laughs> but the complaint is another one. You know, what? Act after act after historical event, you can follow very clearly. And you don't have to read the whole thing every day. You know, read a page a day. Yeah, read a page a day. Educate yourself. So, okay, mahalo. I'm glad, I'm glad I just pull weeds. That's what I do. <laughs> but I learned one thing, and I think it applies here. We all need to live who we say we are. That's right. That's very important. That's paramount. And if we can do that, I think things will happen. Yeah. Anyway, I would like to thank yeah. the three speakers. And right now, we'd like to close because it is getting late. Kau uh, uh, Hanalei, would you like to sure. close this with a prayer? So I'll let you guys know that you guys have an advocate for righteousness. That is amongst you. Paolo Kiyoko, for this wonderful evening and the strategy that obviously has unfolded in the understanding your word declares your people are destroyed for lack of knowing, so tonight that kind of just wiped it all away. Now we know. Now maybe we know with clarity much more on how we need to activate ourselves. Our kupuna saw this day coming. They saw the unfolding, but yet they only got a snapshot. They died in faith, not having walked physically in it. But we here, we're going to see these things come to pass. Yeah. Prophecy will come to pass within our time. Whether anybody likes it or not, and for whatever your good pleasure is in the earth, I know you're going to do them already. You've obviously activated these brothers here and many others. We pray, we pray a covering over these, yes. these men as they yes. walk out their assignments and those within the confines of this room, they're still finding their place. Because like the vision you showed me, the blood that was splattered on the walls and the body parts, we all get the cocoa, but the cocoa needs a vehicle to flow through and we only bits and pieces of the body. 
but may you take your place as the head of our nation so that your good pleasure is done within the earth and this nation is once again brought back into place. So with our lives, we honor you beyond the words. Thanks to Hello Resources.